Hello. Okay. <clears throat> Let's wait a few more minutes as some people join us. Okay, who do we have so far? Huntsville. <clears throat> who might that be? I can't see clearly. You can unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself by pressing the space bar. Okay. Mary and Bill Rashley from Huntsville. Oh, great. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining nice us. <clears throat> um, from Huntsville, tell me your names again. Mary and Bill. Okay, great. And are from you... Huntsville, Ontario, Canada. Oh. Not Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> are you singers conductors or what we're singers nice wonderful sort of. <laughs> good welcome maxim hello welcome so um right now i'm seeing the canadians filling up my screen i'm not sure how i so in the top right oh yeah go from speaker to gallery view. <clears throat> um, on the top right, all I see is a view. Yeah, oh. click that. Yeah, exactly. Great. Awesome. And we do have some people joining us, so, so I don't take up too much of your time. Let me get started for all of our new um, participants today. Welcome. Um, Rena, one second, one second. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think we should wait. I mean, there's no wait a few more minutes because we're expecting a whole lot more sounds good yeah yeah there's more people joining in as we speak yeah there's no we can start at five after what's the difference okay wonderful you know I'm, I'm stopping, whether i stop at one in the morning or 105 what's the difference <laughs> okay don't scare them away harold well they, they're welcome to leave at any time you know that <laughs> <clears throat> oh. Have you been, Harold? Huh? How have you been? I'm well. How have you oh, been? Good. Yeah, all right. Good. Isolated, you know. Yep. I can't wait to for the vaccines to come and distribute it and all that. Yeah, that'll be a while. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm making plans, you know, planning next season, which is keeping me sane. And this is the doing these are keeping me sane. Mm. So um and Maxim, Maxim is a orchestral, he's a composer and an orchestral conductor. Nice to see you again. You know, anybody like Sarah and Elise, you're welcome to un, uh, you know, show, you, show your faces or, you know, right now your video is off, it's up to you, Jerry. Um, you, we, can, we can start now, I think, because it's already uh, three after, we can start, Karina. Okay, awesome. Um, Welcome all to tonight. We are going to be discussing box motets. Um, this is one of the weekly series that lecture series that Harold has been putting on. Um, and we have a lot of new faces today, so we are very excited to have you. Um, there will be a live Q and A at the end of the session tonight. That's open to all participants. If you have any questions, please. Please, please, please raise your hand and Harold will call on you to answer. Since there are so many of us, we have put everyone on mute to avoid extra feedback and background noise. So to unmute yourself, if you have a question or comment during the actual um, lecture, you can unmute yourself by holding down the space bar. Releasing it will mute yourself again automatically. And if any reason this does not work on your computer, you can use the microphone icon that is in the bottom left-hand part of your screen. Beyond the Q&A tonight, Harold has offered to be available for any questions that you may have about anything choral music related, career related, composing related. Um, simply email Harold at haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com and he will set up a phone call or a Zoom meeting with you personally. We will be sending over more information about the organization and about Harold to the chat box. This includes a donation link. These sessions are free, but as you know, or may not know, today is Giving Tuesday, so your donation would be extra special and extra appropriate. 
Any and all donations are of course greatly appreciated. These donations go to Canticorn Virtuosi Inc., which is the non-for-profit that provides funding for both Harold's New York based and um, both of Harold's New York based choirs. And these donations are tax deductible. In the chat box, you will also find our email address. You can use this chat box or that email um, provided to request any technological assistance that you need throughout the um, lecture. Um, before, well, I'll save this last thing and then I will go on to Harold next week, your awesome opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be recording and archiving every video, which includes tonight. So you'll have the opportunity to revisit the material from tonight at your leisure. We will send you the video link to your email after the meeting today, it usually comes out by um, tomorrow morning. And so before I let you take over, Harold wanted me to mention that next week uh, on December 12th, he will be doing, excuse me, he will be doing box B minor math. Um, and he's going to include an interactive conducting um, opportunity during this seminar. So if you would like to um, participate in the interactive conducting, which means you'd have your video on and Harold will be working with you, um, you can email Harold at his email, haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com um, and sign up. So if, also, if you just have questions or want to know more about what that's going to look like, you can email Harold and he'll answer all of your questions. So if I haven't missed anything, Harold, without further ado, I will let you take over. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, just one uh, clarification. Next, next Tuesday and every Tuesday, I'll be doing these free lectures. It's just that uh, the Saturday after next Tuesday on December 12th, I'm having a two and a half hour comprehensive discussion of the B minor mass. And there's a small fee for that. So if you want to just email me, I can tell you all about it. Okay. So to those of you who are new, welcome. Um, I'm not a musicologist per se, but you know I do have over almost a half a century of conducting experience, and um, so and I've done I've done the uh, the Asa Minor Freude maybe I don't know four times. Uh, in fact, I did um, all six motets in one concert three times, once a cappella, and twice with portative organ and cello. This, <clears throat> it's hard to say which is my favorite, but this is certainly uh, a very comprehensive one. I think there are 11 movements. I'm going to actually try to discuss a little bit about each movement tonight. If I don't quite get through it, I, I won't get through it. But um, and I'm talking from a conductor's point of view. I'm not going to talk too much about the actual physical conducting of it, but rather, uh, I will some, somewhat, but rather, my ideas, my interpretive ideas, how I approach a piece like this. Um, Bach apparently intended for all the motets to have accompaniment, but you know they can be done without also. But anyway, let's start right in. The melody apparently was not, writ not written by him. Um, and the, if you're a musicologist out there, and I mean, I'm reading here, it, it says that um, the piece was the piece, the tune was by, by Johann Krüger. So, I mean, we know that many, many of the uh, melodies in the, in the cantatas were not written by him, you know, like the final chorale. But that's neither here or there. Let me just jump right in with interpretive ideas. Um, one second. So, I'm looking at my full score, my uh, my mocked up score. And by the way, as an extra treat, a bonus, anybody writing to me, emailing me after this, doesn't have to be tonight or tomorrow, anytime, requesting this motet fully mocked up, my copy, I will send to you not in the mail, I mean, I'll, I'll email an attachment of Jesus Minor Freud with all my, all my markings in it. Um, you'd be surprised how many conductors don't fully uh, interpret and don't fully uh, explore pieces before they conduct them, before they walk into the first rehearsal. 
I mean, I'll be repeating some things I've said almost every week to some of you who have, who have come, but for those of you who are new, especially, I will say that in all the 1800 or so concerts I have conducted, I've never ever stepped into the first rehearsal without singing in my head every single part, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and marking them up and supplying those marks to the singers before, before the first rehearsal somehow. Um, it's not just the top line that you want to pay attention to, it's all of them, especially with Bach. And even when it's homophonic, that is chordal, chordal, um, you know, if every, every line has a, has a life of its own. So, um, even though, let's look, look, look at the opening soprano line. Da, 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 da. It's, a, it's a complete descent. So a typical, you know, young singer, high school, college kid who doesn't, is not really in a good choir, you know, mediocre choir or just an average choir. And the conductor might not have studied this too much. They might sing it like this. Jesu meine Freude, like getting softer as it get as the as the pitch gets lower. But um, my my go to is to say <clears throat> that you should sing it the way you speak it. So it's Jesu meine Freude, Jesus my joy. So and even if you don't speak the language, even if you don't know what it means, it's, it seems pretty obvious. You know the the next line is minus Hetzem's Weide. So. How do you notate that in the score? <clears throat> you can put a little horizontal line under F-R-E-U. That's one way of accenting it. Um, to, 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 to most singers in New York City, for example, where most of my work is done, to all professional singers, um, a horizontal line means a slight accent. Or you might put a little crescendo, a little crescendo from, from the fourth note to the fifth. But then you have to put a decrescendo. And you always have to decide how long the decrescendo should be. I mean, should it be a two beats or, or just one beat uh, from the second to the third beat? I mean, it's especially important to have a decrescendo because a typical bass, look at the bass line. Jesu meine Freude. You know, it jumps up a fourth. It's crazy. You have to put a decrescendo to, to, so that doesn't happen. The next thing I want to talk about is the length of the breath. And well, let's just talk about the formatas. Just cross them out. They don't really mean hold the note. It's a musicological thing. We can talk about it some other time. And if you want them to breathe after Freude and after minus Hetzem's Weide, you have to decide how long a breath there should be. Now, the singers will, they'll, if you gave them the, um, a, if, you, if you took a vote, they'll all say, I want a quarter breath because a quarter breath is, you know, a nice full breath and an eighth breath makes them hold the half note for three quarters of its value and then take a very quick breath. So it depends. I mean, I, I've thought about this a lot in this piece and um, I've, come, I've come to the conclusion that there should be eighth breaths, but <clears throat> sometimes you want that Okay, so if you're doing this in a cathedral, a live cathedral, you'll probably want a quarter rest because even when they cut out, you're gonna hear reverberation. If you do this in a dead hall, <clears throat> it's completely different. Then you might certainly want an eighth breath only. But there's something else uh, I wanna say, which is sometimes it's really hard to get eighth breath sometimes and they're, they're not doing it uniformly. So sometimes I just say, Okay, let's try this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Take a, a short breath, but don't worry about the length. Just make it natural. And what that usually translates to is that it's a dotted eighth breath, believe it or not, but they don't know it. And I haven't said it. And they're usually together when I say that. It's somehow they, they do it together. It's just a trick of the trade. So let me move on. <clears throat> Excuse me? Yeah. Before you move on, my son actually has a legitimate question. I know the answer, but I thought it might be interesting if he asks you. Okay, what's your son's name? <laughs> what's your question? Your grandson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your question? Um, I noticed in the sheet music, in the tenor section, 
Yeah. They're singing the highest. There's like that eight under the treble clef. That means the tenor is singing higher than the soprano or the alto. That okay. makes no sense. It's the opposite. The eight under the treble clef means that they sing an octave lower than written. Oh. Yeah. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. You'll oh, maybe it's like, oh, <laughs> above. For... Okay, thank you. Um... <laughs> Call me tomorrow, Jesse. Okay. Um, so mute yourself now, okay? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, I know how to do it. Just of course. Every young kid knows how to do it. All right. So anyway, let's go on. Um, but I do, um, one second, let me, <clears throat> I do have people taking a quarter breath after, after measure four. Yezu my Nazi off because that's the end of a section. No, then you go back to the beginning. It's the end of a section. Okay, let me not prolong this. Um, look at the um, <clears throat> end of this movement. Let's scroll down a little bit. <clears throat> so the very last phrase, the question is, should there be a retard? Yes, of course. Should you subdivide the tenor part? Not if it's a slight retard, but if you have a big retard, um, I'll sing the last two measures of the tenor part. <laughs> Certainly subdivide the tenor part. Okay, now the next movement. Uh, this brings me back to like 30 something years ago, 35 years ago when I first heard this performed live. And also keep in mind that the um, <clears throat> Early movement, or early music movement, came to the forefront around then, and you started having these, these new ideas. And until then, I was, you know, young and, and experienced, and I took things literally. So if I see, you know, I would, I'd want to do them as full, full value. And then I learned. And then I heard a performance once live where the conductor went as this nest 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 and I freaked out. I said, what the heck is going on? How can I how can he take that liberty? And then I started, you know, reading things and, and noticing that, you know, Baroque orchestras would some would very often not hold values the what's printed, but they'd shorten it. And then I'd realized that there's there's much more to interpreting than just you know getting the notes and rhythms and words and dynamics right. It took a long time for me to really see um, come up. Well, how can I put it? A long time to really fully embrace it and to actually embrace it such that it took over. You know, like personal preferences. Uh, of course, you know, took over. Of course, you have to know what the words mean. We won't go into the words right now, but um, but you know, I just felt that it should be staccato. Um, Harold, yeah. Harold, yeah. we we sang this in 1980 in Paris and and in uh, you know Chartres, and oh. I have I have your score in front of me. Uh, God, from the old days. So you wrote poco marcato for that, so you were kind of there and uh, mezzo forte. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was kind of there, but I still hadn't realized that you can really shorten the notes and make them staccato. Um, even that fourth, even that fourth note. Um, thank you for reminding me. I forgot that. Wow. I know we did um, the uh, <clears throat> Cantique de Jean Racine. Yep. There. Yeah, I turned pages for that. Oh my God! <laughs> Turn pages, and I lost one of my tenors because you we, maybe you were singing while you were turning the pages. No. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me now. I'll go on. Now, in the fourth measure, I have a wavy line because I feel that as legato, and I have a wavy line, which to me, you know, indicates legato in my score, and I tell my singers what that means. And then I have crescendo like nicht crescendo and an accent. 
on Dom, a crescendo to Dom and an accent on Dom. Okay, the, I mean that, you know, then it, be, it echoes, scroll down, the whole thing echoes. Now here's something really interesting at measure 36, 36. Now, this is a, a fugal type of, or at least an imitative passage, and you might not notice it, but look at the tenor part. They have the melody. I mean, the soprano part has a beautiful melody too. But the tenors have Now, why am I pointing this out? Look, scroll down for a moment. And look at look what the altos have. Actually, can you scroll back up for a minute? Ah, yes. So look what the altos have in uh, in measure in the third measure on the page. They have the same thing the tenors have. Now go go ahead, go down. Then the mezzo sopranos have that in measure forty three, right? Oh, well, actually, the sopranos have it in forty. And the mezzos have it in 43, and the basses finally have it in 46. Let's go down for a moment. The basses are waiting patiently. That, there's a joke about that. It's the bottom of the ninth, you know, Beethoven's ninth. The basses are loaded because they went out to drink because they weren't playing the little bass for a while. Anyway, it's a bad joke. Go on to measure 40, what? 40, 46. Keep going. Ah, the basses come in. So, what's my point? Let's go back up to. I mean, this whole thing started in measure 30, 30, my vision is not as good as it used to be, 36. So I have in my score, um, I crossed out the fortes. Even, you know something, even if, even if they're box markings and they probably are, I think some modification is fine. You know, I mean, they didn't, in those days they didn't mark mezzo piano, or, you know, they had just piano forte, that kind of thing. I have everybody singing mezzo piano here except the tenors. And I have the tenors singing forte. And you might think that's sacrilegious. So they're, yeah, they're singing. And then, then uh, believe it or not, I'm going to sing the tenor part. Notice what I do. I, I retreated. I got softer when the altos came in so that now only the altos are forte. They come in forte. Back and forth, back and forth, that whole thing. So that at any given moment, because that melody uh, is marked forte and nobody else is forte at that time throughout this whole section, you hear those lines stand out. It's something I do a lot. Um, and then in measure 32, 32, 32, yeah. Um, 20, 32, let me just look here. Ah, oh, looks like it's 52, sorry. Okay. 52, right. And then I have everybody singing forte on Zondem. So, Zondem, Zondem, Geist. Yeah. Um, so on and so forth. Let's go to the next, and then that kind of repeats, you know. Um, the chorale is nothing, let's, yeah, just go down to the measure 104. We don't need to talk about that because it's the same principle. Well, actually the end of the chorale I like to talk about. Yeah, the second half of the chorale. I think you have to move on from there. You're at 99, this is 104. Scroll down just a little bit more. Here we go. You know, it doesn't even have a dynamic marking. So you have to think of the words and, you know, and it's all about Satan doing his thing. So it's loud. Um, and then if you look at, um, continue, go down a little bit, measure 106. I don't have the translation in front of me right here, but I mean, it's all about, <clears throat> you know, clock and splits. I remember it's something about lightning and thunder and all kinds of horrible sounds. Maybe somebody has the translation there, but I have that suddenly marcato. So the whole thing has been legato. So I'll sing the top of top of the page. And then suddenly, blitzed. Now you have to be careful um, when you have T Z T at the end of blitz. 
not to have an eighth breath there because there are too many consonants. So make that a full quarter breath. Now, then I have legato. And then I have mezzo piano, which I mean, um, it means something like Jesus will help us or something like that. So I'm just reflecting the text. I'm just saying that, you know, a chorale doesn't have to be monolithic or, or you know, just doesn't have to be doing the same thing throughout. Okay, then we have um, a three part movement. Um, now, Bach, as you know, <laughs> as you might have found, discovered, anybody who sung Bach, he didn't really think of the voice. He did not think of individual singers. And proof of that is right here, where you have no breath for the soprano one. I don't, I don't see any uh, rests, quarters, eighths. I don't see it. Scroll down a bit. Okay, no breath still. Scroll down. Ah, letter G. By that time, there's a lot of lethargy because they're so tired of not breathing. Okay, I'm only kidding. Now go back up and let's talk about when you'd want them to breathe. You meaning the conductor and how to do it. Um, sometimes it's not so easy to have them breathe in a certain spot or to conduct it. Now, here's an example. I would like them to go all the way to the fourth measure and breathe after machet, even though there's no punctuation there. Um, it just seems to me that it's a fine place to breathe. Again, I don't have the translation here, but I remember, especially since the altos have a comma there and they can breathe easily. But how do they breathe? How do they catch a breath after singing such a long time and you know getting out of breath? Well, first of all, they can, of course, um, stagger breathe at any time, but let me sing the opening. Now, I'd like them all to breathe there, but very often in rehearsals, well, not very often, but sometimes I get a request from a singer to let them take a little more time. Sometimes I grant that request and sometimes I don't feel it's appropriate. Here I do. In other words, let me let me sing from the fourth measure. From from the fourth measure. In Christo. See, I delayed. I delayed the in Christo entrance. Now, how do you conduct that? Um, so you can all see me, right? I can't really see myself, but I would do it like this. I'm starting from the fourth measure. See what I did? I simply I didn't go like this. I did not do. I didn't subdivide the second beat. I did not go one and two and three. I simply used gravity and made a nice arch. And of course, it's it's been rehearsed so that they know what's coming. So I would go. And somehow it works. It's something that's not easy to do for young conductors, but it's, it's not that it's not all that difficult. So if you get the concept, you have a nice flowing beat and a nice arch, you can do it. Now, here's another issue. Um, if you look at measure 131, the bass part. Um, well, let's look at the whole, all three parts. So I want the basses to breathe. I want the sopranos to breathe. Um, probably I want the um, soprano two to breathe with the soprano one. Let's just assume that. And let's say it's an eighth breath. If you make it, if you make the soprano parts an eighth breath, they'll like that. The sopranos will like it instead of a sixteenth breath, which the basses have to do. So the question is, you see what I mean? The basses can't take an eighth breath there. They have a note on the end of three. So the question is, um, should you delay the downbeat? Yes, I think so. Give them a little extra time to breathe. And then the other question is, should you have the soprano parts breathing with the basses? Uh, not the basses, the alto. The bottom part is the alto. 
breathing with the bottom part, or let them just take an eighth and let the alto just sort of stick out for a brief moment. If the upper two parts take an eighth breath, then they're cutting off as the C natural in the lowest part is sounding, but it's only gonna be staccato it, because he's taking a, they're taking breaths. Even, there's a slight, uh, even though there's a slight extension of the breath, you're gonna hear the bass for like a 20th of a second. It never really bothers me or virtually never bothers me to have that happen. So in other words, make it easier for the sopranos and have the basses, I mean, the alto, the bottom part, um, you know, linger the way I described it. And, uh, or you can just have them all breathe together, but it's harder to get, it's harder to get the upper parts to breathe with the alto if, if they don't have, you know, two eighth notes printed. Okay, that's what I want to say about that. The way I notate breaths on the downbeat, look at measure 136. 136, I would simply, I would not just put a check mark. Let's say you want the sopranos to cut off on the downbeat. So starting on the page. So you want them to cut off on the downbeat. I would put a breath mark, but I would also put a, a diagonal, a, you know, a diagonal line through, through the downbeat. I'd cross out that first note and put a check mark <clears throat> either right on top of that note or slightly to the right. I wouldn't just put a breath mark there because they might think it's going to be an, a 16th, tied over to a 16th and then a breath. So just cross it out, make it easy for them. Okay. Subdivide the very last measure, of course. Why not? Then the next movement is very similar to the second. It's the very similar <clears throat> throats. Throats in, in terms of the nature of the, you know, the staccatos and the accents and all that. Be really careful because 99 out of 100 singers are gonna go, I'll sing the soprano part. Throats, throats, demo. They're gonna accent the high note. And it's throats dem alten drachen, not dem alto, not dem alten. I mean, she hasn't been knighted by the queen, so why call it dame? Okay, never mind. So throats dame alten drachen. Again, sing it the way you'd speak it. Even though the um, the the third note for the soprano one is you know way up there, you got to tame the chorus. So the way to do that is you know you put you put an accent or a tenuto or horizontal line above a l above the b. And even if they sing the high F sharp loudly, they'll sing the B louder than that. So that really takes care of it. Detail, detail. There's so much detail, which I love. Well, let's go on, because this is a really interesting section, measure 154, 155. Um, yeah, I have <clears throat> right there in the center of the page, measure 154. Throws Rocking throats, or rocking throats, throats, This is one of those times. Um, we're talking about measure 160, Karina. Scroll down a bit. Yeah, this is one of those times where I want <clears throat> uh, an ex a delay before the conglomerate throats there in 160 before the second beat. After this section, starting from on the page. I just, I just feel a need for it not to be metronomic there. I can't explain it. And then the basses have and you know, if there's a little bit of a problem with them getting that coloratura, have them sing H's, you know, because the audience won't really hear the H's. They'll just hear like articulation. If they really have a problem, I talked about this once, have half of them go, like think of Dorothy's dog in the Wizard of Oz, Toto, or D's instead of T's, and the other half just sing H's. And the audience will hear beautiful articulation. They won't hear the H in particular, particularly. They won't hear the D. It'll be nice. Um, you know, don't hesitate to interpret. 
uh, so uh, right after that base run, look at the bottom of the, scroll down a bit. Look at the uh, third measure on bottom. Und spring, tobe welt und spring. A lot of things to mark in the music there. A big decrescendo into the fourth measure, a breath, a legato marking, tobe welt und spring. And make sure they get the T on welt. Tobe welt und spring, right? And make, make uh, I have GE on Springer staccato. Ich, st yeah, stay here. And make them roll the R's if they can on H I E R. So much detail. All right, let's go to the next movement because I promised I would try to do that. Well, actually, there's a, yeah, the next part of this movement. Go ahead, keep going. Keep going. Here it is. Uh, yeah, it is. Well, in my score, it's not the next movement, but here we are. I have this little hairpin on Fleisch. And make sure they don't sing Iraba. 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 No. In German, every every word that begins with a vowel has to have a glottal before it. And then I have them singing legato. I have each part singing mezzo piano here when they come in. But when the basses come in, go all the way to 217, Karina. When the basses come in, there are three parts above them. I have them singing mezzo, mezzo forte, just so they'll stand out a little more. Yeah, you know, you don't have to stick with, and then, and then, all, and then there are really interesting things happening. I'll just tell you, starting at 219, 219, so the basses, yeah, the basses are singing mezzo forte. Let me just check back here. And they're still singing mezzo forte. I have the, um, the middle part. Well, in my score, it's the middle part. And this score I'm, that you're looking at, it's the, it's the uh, yeah, it's the, mm, yeah, it's the middle part, sorry. So I have them singing mezzo piano plus and the soprano singing mezzo piano plus so that the um, bass still stands out. But the mezzo piano plus in 219 in the first soprano changes to a mezzo, mezzo forte in the second measure like this. Here's the first measure, soprano one, second note. And then I have them back to mezzo piano with a decrescendo into a, yeah, it's like, I just love bringing out lines and having the audience hear the beauty in each line, the interaction, the importance. And, uh, I'm, you know, I've heard plenty of performances live and, you know, on YouTube where every line is just as loud all the time. Boring. Um, okay. That kind of thing. And then it builds towards the end. Okay. Let's go to the next movement. The Chorale, 258. Here's something interesting. Um, well, I have, I have the soprano singing forte legato and the other parts away, away. You are my something. I, don't, I should have had the translation here, but I don't. Away. So the soprano, the, the lower three parts, big, big, mit, ah, uh, right? But the top parts, big, mit, ah, uh, completely legato. It's sort of like, um, there's a piece by Brahms, Oh, Zuster, My, Oh, Sweet May, with a soprano. I mean, it's in four parts. But the soprano is a little bit different from the others. And you want to bring that out. Or um, another piece I was thinking of is like the Silver Swan by Gibbons, is it? And if you notice every, you know, all the other parts besides the top part, they cut off before the downbeat a number of times, but the soprano part cuts off on the downbeat, and you don't want to interfere with that. You want to bring that out. But Here's the thing I really wanted to talk about in this movement. Scroll down a bit. The B section. The B section. That's it. So uh, the can sopranos continue legato. And the other parts go. I didn't have to do that. 
but I just felt, um, you know, it's about being on the cross and dying, and I, you know, it's more dramatic uh, to make them uh, like a duplet effect. Okay, next movement. I have a in my note in my in my book in red. I have the words slower H R. That's me, Harold Rosenbaum. Slower H R. Because you know when the adrenaline is flowing, and you go from one movement to another, you don't always have the time to think. <laughs> you should, so you study this. You study this for months in advance, and hopefully the tempo will be there. But the adrenaline, you know, can can alter your perspective. Um, and people, you know, my biggest criticism of performances of Bach that I've heard, generally speaking, is they're taken too quickly. I know the early movement. I mean, it can go both ways. I mean, if it's a, if it's an orchestral piece, even by Bach, um, like you know, the inter, an interlude in the Christmas Oratorio, which is in twelve a time, and it really should move. It's nice, da 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 da, not da 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 da. But when the harmonies change so frequently, and there are so many small note values, it's nice to not go too fast. Who knows what too fast really means? Um, but I, I have a sense of it when I hear something that's just too fast. It's like if you watch Modern Family or The West Wing, which I've been watching on Netflix, I think, I think it, The West Wing. And they talk so quickly, I just have to tune into the Andy Griffith show once in a while or Leave it to Beaver to have a little repose from the frantic of it all. Okay, so here I am talking about Bach, Leave it to Beaver, and the West Wing, and Andy and Don Knotts, but it's all related. Okay, but you do want to have a very flowy, it's in 12a, you have, want to have this flow um, and not be clunky, but um, in this case, you know, you, you just want to conduct it in slow four. There is a piece by Samuel Barber called uh, Reincarnations. And uh, the last, the three pieces, and the last one is called, um, well, the word, I forget the title, but the, the, the words are come with me under my coat. It's in 12.8. It's, it's really slow, slower than this would be. It's one, two, three. And in that piece, sometimes I feel I should do this. Two, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one. Sometimes I wanna put that, you know, third beat within each beat in because there's a word change or a syllable change happening. And so you have to just be flexible with your conducting and figure these things out. Um, okay, let's go to the next movement, which is I think the most sublime Gute Nacht. I don't know if you know this. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. The altos have the chorale. Gute Nacht. Oh, what are the words in? Gute Nacht. Oh, I mean, these were all, these, this motet was written most likely for a funeral service. You know, and Bach, of course, believed in the afterlife and, you know, resurrection and joy everlasting and uh, so for him you know the whole process was joyful i mean think of the brahms requiem every movement ending in joy even though it's a, requ a requiem so anyway back to um the actual interpretation of this what i like to have here is the altos stand out by having a, a higher volume it's soprano one soprano two alto and tenor okay you might say, well, why bother? Because their part is just quarter notes and half notes. So in that sense, it's gonna stand out anyway. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, you know? Now, if we were doing do fa, you know the misa? Oh, I just thought of this. Uh, Say la fasa e pi. Okay, do fa was the greatest early Renaissance composer and he wrote a piece, a mass. He wrote a mass based on a popular song which was 
in French, say la face pie, if your face be pale. And everybody knew that melody in, the, in those times. It was a popular song. If my face be pale, it's because I'm in love. And he changes the words. He, he makes it curie a laison instead of say la face et pie. And he has them as very, 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 very long notes. Like each note is like four measures long. And he wanted them hidden. He didn't want them to stand out. He was playing a joke on everybody. So in that sense, you might want it hidden. But here, I think I want it to stand out. How do I? How much do I want it to stand out? I tell my singers that, let's say you have um, 20 singers doing this piece. So in this movement, you have 16 singers because it's in four parts and there are no basses. I tell my singers that collectively, I want the altos to be heard louder than everybody else collectively. So whatever that means to them. So maybe that means pianissimo or piano, you know, you can't, you can't always dictate, you know, what you have to experiment. You know, if you're doing this with the Metropolitan Opera Chorus, a, a piano is gonna be like, pretty darn loud. Anyway, that's an interesting way of putting it. So they, if, while they're singing, they should be, while everybody is singing their part, they should be able to hear the alto part come forth, come out. It's an interesting concept. It might be too loud, so then you adjust it, whatever. Okay, let's look at the next movement. When I do this uh, B minor mass discussion, I'm gonna take a more time, you know, because like we have, we'll have much more time. <clears throat> um, so this is the same exact music as the second movement. As east nun nichts, nichts. But here I don't have it staccato anymore. So no, no. I, sorry, it's not legato. I have more cato, not staccato. So nun de full value, full value. Don't ask me why. Sometimes an, an interpretation just comes to a conductor and, and he or she doesn't need to explain it. If it seems right, if it seems stylistic, <clears throat> of course we have no recordings of the music from back then, but you know, there is a, tr a tradition at Thomas Kircher in, in Leipzig, unbroken tradition. I've, I've been there, I've heard their choir. By the way, I didn't think much of their interpretation that day, but uh, that's another story. Um, something might have gotten lost in the translation over 250 years, but that was just that day in that particular piece. That's just me. Um, yeah, and then on the word toten in measure five, the fifth measure, I, I, I have a mark here that I asked them for a darker tone. I mean, my German is not great, but I wouldn't sing to, to, it's tot and death. So I asked for more of, a, more of a, a darker tone. And then later on in this movement, you have that same thing in measure 423, where, you know, one part, like, und, the tenors, und das Willen, das, und, oh, villain, villain. Und, und das Willen, das. So that would be louder than all the other parts, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go to the next movement. Oh, that, this is it. Then there's the chorale. Um, here I have a hairpin, even on the first note, I have to bring it out. You know, there are many ways to bring out a note. You can do an accent, you can do a slight accent, you can crescendo through it, you can crescendo halfway through it, and then decrescendo, you can approach it with more, like sort of an elongated consonant beforehand. You can, instead of going, you can go like more start the V sound sooner, all kinds of ways. You can do a hairpin. Yeah, I end this, uh, I end the concert with the second half of this, let's scroll down a bit. The second half is marcato, and the very last phrase, since, you know, this, they're basically saying, you know, I'm gonna be with you in death. I know you'll support me. I know you'll be there for me. Yes, my joy. And the very last two, me two and a half measures I do very softly. And you know something? Um, I mean, suddenly soft, yeah. Like as if you're just 
on your knees and just in his hands. And I, you know, I, I've done, I don't, I think maybe one of the times I did this piece, I didn't end up doing it that way because I just didn't feel it at the moment. So you have to tell your singers to be, uh, you know, prepared to, to be spontaneous in performance. So, are there any questions? I see Gaither, I don't see you, but welcome Gaither, I haven't talked to you in years. You can uh, unmute yourself and show yourself if you want, but only if you want. And Jerry, I don't know you, but welcome. Oh, there you are, nice to see you. Okay, any questions? about this piece or anything choral? If not, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily specifically about this, Harold, but yeah. uh, I was wondering what the current thinking was. There was a lot of dispute at one point about how many singers on a part in Bach works, uh, even the B minor mass. I mean, you had, you know, a I'm chorus or, or, you know, one on a part kind of a controversy. Did you ever hear Joshua Rifkin's performance of the B minor mass with one on a part? Yes. I mean, so did I. And what can I say? Again, I'm not a musicologist, but he seems to have hit upon something with a lot of musicologists uh, saying, yeah, they think it could have been done that way or maybe it was, but I mean, can you think of, skipping ahead a little bit, can you think of like Beethoven's Misa Solemnis being done with one on a part? This <laughs> a little crazy. You know? I, I, Good point. It, did, it just didn't have the right meat on it. And I'm a vegetarian. That's, a, that's a good way to put it. I like that. It didn't have enough soy turkey on it. I'm a vegetarian. I mean, <laughs> oh, yes. that's issue entirely. So, the protein. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, you have the um, Bach, what is it called, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I think they did the New York, the American premiere of the B minor mass in the late 19th century. Um, B minor mass, and that's a chorus of you know well over a hundred, but I think you know that's probably that's too much. Mm. That's that's the um, pre, um, you know, emergence of the awareness of performance practice kind practice. of. You had Stokowski, you know, arranging uh, a fugue for a uh, hundred strings and that kind of thing. <laughs> but, yeah. So that's my feeling. I think you, I think you can, you can do this nicely with a, a chamber choir, maybe a chorus of 40 even, but if to have it, have this piece done by 60 or 70 or 80, I uh, doesn't make it. Having yeah. said that, I think one of these sessions, I walked into a, a rehearsal in Halle, Germany. I walked into a church and I saw like 200 teeny boppers, like a middle school singing a, a Bach motet beautifully. Beautifully. I mean, it was in their blood. They grew up with wow. it. Wow. So I, I was, my immediate reaction was not, oh my God, there are too many. My immediate reaction was like, oh my God, they're singing it so beautifully. And why can't we do this in America? <laughs> that That's impressive. You know, and as a one-time music teacher, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, exposing yeah. all these kids and getting them to participate, not just hear it, but participate in wonderful music is just you know outstanding and more power to them and my hats off to all these you know wonderful directors of youth choirs and in, in, all over the world it's not my thing i once when i was in college i thought i'd be a music education major and i actually student taught in junior high school for one day and i said nah <laughs> i cannot do this <laughs> walk all over me i'm gonna them, you know forget it <laughs> uh, believe me, I've, yes, I've been there, done that, K through 12, oh my God. Don't get me and wrong. I don't know, and, 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 as, and by the way, but the worst of it is not the students, it's administration. Yeah, and the, some of the parents too. <laughs> and uh, yes, and, par and some parents, right, exactly. I love kids, but junior high school, they're a little weird, you know. They, they are, that was definitely my least favorite. <laughs> um, you know, there's a limit to what you can do musically with elementary school, but that doesn't mean you can't do something. Also, with elementary school, 
you often have more of a chance to influence and mold. Of course. And that's the thing, you know. You saw, uh, my, you saw my grandson come on. Yeah. He's so into classical music. His mother's a tenured high school choral teacher in, in uh, Nassau County. She, she loves all types of music, including classical, all types of music. Mm -hmm. his, his father's a you know, rock band musician, guitar player. And he likes all that too, but you know, I called him three mornings ago. He said, Grandpa, I'm, I've been listening over and over again to Winter from, Vival from Antonio Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I love it. And he starts singing it. You know, I'm so happy. Oh, that's great. That's great. Really yeah, I mean, I've, I've taught in Harlem and, you know, the, uh, for example, and the, and the Bronx, the Soundview section, I did what I could to introduce students. But I, in elementary school, you have, you really have much more influence. Of course. Um, it, doing, for example, doing spirituals in Harlem with these young kids, and they would go, why are we singing church songs? And I said, they're not just church songs. They right. thought of it as, you know, like hymns in church and didn't realize the broader context. Right, of course. Which is what I was able to instruct them about. Well, yeah, yeah, I get it. Anybody else, any questions or comments? I see Maxim, is that your son? I can't quite see. Yes, yes, this is Julian. Oh, hello, Julian. <laughs> okay, he's shy now. Okay, that's okay. All Harold, right. Harold, <laughs> after my uh, my student teaching in choral music in junior high school, I vowed never to teach choral music again. You know, and I retired after 35 years of doing that. <laughs> so, but, but this teacher had great uh, classroom management. He would let the class get louder and louder and louder talking. And then he would shout them down like a maniac. And then of course, five minutes later, it would rise again. And I sat there going, I don't want to do this. This is awful. You know, and I found out that guy, the teacher was on his third heart attack. Oh so, my. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. I know. I taught at the, the Rudolf Steiner High School, a private school in Manhattan. Yeah. And most of the, the kids that were, who were not on scholarship were very well from wealthy parents. And one kid said, I'm not going to listen to my teachers. I'm going to be a professional tennis player. Why do I have to listen to it? was tough. Yeah. <laughs> it was tough. Yeah. But, but then again, there are countless wonderful teachers who know how to work with kids. And I, my hat's off to them. I mean, I, I had a youth choir for 19 years. I used to love it. They met in my house. But my, they were well behaved because my wife fed them... Uh, brownies and Perrier afterwards, you know? So. <laughs> what was in the brownies? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was afterwards. Okay. Everybody, do you, how many of you knew this piece already before tonight? A little bit. Listen to it. I didn't know the motets till I was about 30. I was stunned that I did, hadn't heard of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're so spiritual. So one after another, yes. calm mm -hmm. you, the way calm Jesus calm starts, you know, calm Jesus calm. You have to be, you have to tread lightly. You're, you're, in, you're in, on sacred ground when you conduct that stuff. That's how I feel. Bach alone, just conducting Bach is, is tough because it's perfect music and all that. But when you do something where you're trying to get the singers to plead and, and call for Jesus to come, I'm not being, I'm not trying to proselytize here. I'm, I mean, I'm Jewish. I mean, I'm just saying when you're on stage, you act, right? You, you, we're all actors on stage, but it has to be done just right. And sometimes I think about, like I said, I, um, you know, I thought about the opening of the B minor mass for months and the second movement of the Verdi Requiem for months, how to really do it right. Um, and I came, I, I realized something, and I could be wrong, but I just realized something this week, you know, because obviously Mendelssohn brought Bach's music back to life, right? So Mendelssohn's Elijah, and I'm not home, I don't have the score here, but Mendelssohn's Elijah starts with Elijah singing a cappella 
a few measures. And then the overture comes. Dun, 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 dun. At the very end of the overture, the, the chorus, it leads right into the chorus singing, help Lord. In a sense, I wonder if he got that from the B minor mass, because the B minor mass has four measures, Kyrie, right? The chorus and orchestra, and then the chorus drops out and the orchestra has this really long introduction. Dun, 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 dun. Then the chorus comes in with that after like a full minute. I think he modeled it after the B minor mass opening. And I, I'm wondering, I don't know. Ah, <sighs> music. Okay. So, Thank you all so much for joining us. What are we doing next week, Karina? So next week we have Mozart's Requiem, which is very exciting. And then of course, so that's the eighth. And then of course we have on the 12th, Fox B minor mass. Again, there's a small fee if you would like to participate. Um, I've been to many of Harold's um, conducting, from conducting workshops to the conducting series we did here. They are a wonderful opportunity. So just email him at haroldrosenbaum.com for some more information or to sign up for that. At gmail.com. At gmail.com, what did I say? You don't wanna know. Oh boy. <laughs> that's all right. You said haroldrosenbaum.com. Oh, haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com. And, uh, and he'll give you more information on that. And if not, we'll see you next week. All Thank right. you. You're welcome. You. Rick, yeah. I want to talk to you sometime. Call me about this Thank trip. You. 40 years. Uh, what? The trip we had. It was 40 years ago. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> All right. I'll call you. Yeah, call me. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a good week, everybody. Bye-bye.